Okay, very good. So we will roll right into this. So today we're going to talk about Iron Ridge mounting systems for a pitch roof. And that includes for comp shingle, metal roofs, tile roofs. Um, we have attachments for all different types. Um, quickly, a little background on myself. I'm not going to go into all the details here, but suffice it to say that I've been in this for a long time, over 28 years. And so I have a lot of experience, or you might say I'm just old. Um, so today we're going to cover, I'll do a quick intro about what uh, the background on Iron Ridge. We'll go into the flush mount system uh, and the components, and then we'll talk about some advanced uh, design topics. And we'll go into a little bit of installation tips and tricks. And I also intend to go through our design tool. And hopefully we'll have time for a question and answer. But if, if we run out of time, um, uh, please join us in a network, networking session later today. And we would be happy to answer any questions. Um, so a little history. Uh, Iron Ridge was founded in 1996 by Craig Carney. And uh, he worked in construction uh, and metalwork industry. He saw a need for solar uh, mounting systems. And, you know, at that time when I was an installer back in the 90s and we were kind of making our own uh, out of, you know, you know strut or uh, aluminum angle. So Craig was a pioneer in, in bringing about engineered uh, systems to, to uh, solar. So we also uh, are part of ESDEC and ESDEC is the parent company of Iron Ridge and Quick Mount and Iron Ridge and Quick Mount operate as one business unit. Um, and then, but we also have some sister companies in EcoFast and, and Panel Claw. So Iron Ridge makes a flush mount for pitched roofs, a tilt mount uh, for flat roofs, a ground mount, and a ballasted system for flat roofs. So today we're gonna to talk about the flush mount system. Tomorrow we'll be covering the ground mount system. Uh, quick mount products, um, we have roof attachments for all types of roofs, anything from comp shingle, cedar shake roofs, uh, metal shingles, tile, um, you know, low slope flat roofs. We have attachments for all those types of roofs. So we'll go through uh, the flush mount system. Um, it's really simple. I mean, we have a rail, we have a module clamp, and then we have the roof attachment and then the bonding hardware. So these are the main components um, and we'll go into a little detail about that because it really comes down to the engineering and the various options. Um, so we have three different sizes of rail. So the XR10 being the smallest, most economical size of rail, XR100, the medium grade, and then the XR1000, which is our um, largest um, rail and each one can span further distances between attachments and we have that curved shape which gives it more strength um, both vertically and laterally as well. So we also make a product <clears throat> called our we call it a UFO which is a universal fastening object and it is our module clamp and it's one piece unit that is adjustable from 30 to 46 millimeter um, for module frame sizes that are common right now. And then we have a snap on end clamp or stopper sleeve that turns it into an end clamp. Um, and those are available in all the common uh, module sizes, uh, frame thicknesses from 30 to 46 millimeter. And this has integrated grounding, so you don't need uh, additional weave clips or grounding. It bonds everything, uh, the module frame to our rail. So the whole UFO family, everything is bonding um, from the rail attachment, the uh, hardware, the micro inverter kits, the structural splices, and the ground lug. And so we have a low profile ground lug um, that can be uh, mounted underneath the modules uh, or uh, 
on the rail on top of the rail and it can be rotated in either direction and all of our hardware uses the same socket size a 7 16 socket so whether you're tightening the module clamps the ground lugs any of the components on the flush mount system it uses a 7 16 socket so you only need one tool we also have a micro inverter, so it's basically a T bolt kit that allows you to attach the micro inverter or optimizer to the rail. And um, our installation manual, you know, lists all the popular uh, ones like Enphase, AP, Garfon, uh, Solar Edge, and Tygo. Then we also have a hidden end clamp, so. If you want, instead of having the uh, end clamp and the rail visible at the end of the array, um, you can cut the rail flush with the module frame and then use this clamp underneath. And there's no tools required. It's bonding and grounding. It just acts like a lever and uh, rotates onto the module, the flange of the module frame. So you can see here, you slide it into the rail, you set the module down, you slide it up against the module on top of the flange and then rotate it. And it has little teeth that actually bite into the module frame and gives you a good strong uh, clamp and bonding and grounding. So that's an option uh, and if you want that uh, hidden appearance. So this is our old uh, splice called the classic splice. There may be some inventory still um, available, but uh, basically it uses uh, four screws to hold it um, to the rail and splice the rail. Our new splice is called the boss bonded structural splice. And this has no tools required, no screws, self-centering, and it has um, little bonding teeth on it that actually give you a ground bond um, to the splice when it, and it, so it just slides in and locks into place and gives you a bond. And it also acts as an expansion joint if you allow a gap um, between the, the rails, um, it can be used as an expansion joint. So the benefits of this splice are old splice, Place in the center of a span or near the last end roof attachment. So now with the new bus splice, you can splice anywhere in a span and the only or the last uh, past the last attachment. So we have roof attachments, you know, so for many different types of roofs. So Comp shingle is the most uh, common type of roof if you for the house for uh, metal standing seam or metal shingles. We have different roof attachments available. So our flash roof attachments, we have a flash foot two, the flash view, the L mount, and the Q base comp mount. These are all for comp shingles. And I'll give you a little detail on what each one is how they're different. So the flash foot two, we consider our premium product. Um, it has a raised platform where the lag bolt goes in, and then that is encapsulated by the cap. So it's all a straight vertical line from where the rail attaches down through, and it's the uh, highly waterproof, um, good quality attachment. And it can be, and that cap can be installed so that the rail runs either east-west or north-south, um, just by turn how you start it when you turn it on to the base of the flashing. We also have what's called the flash view, and what's different about this is that it's a lower profile, so it's it's closer to the roof, and. It also can rotate 360 degrees so you're not locked in you know say if you have an unusual situation where you need to angle the array say along the lines of a hip roof or something not very common application but you know this allows you to rotate that top cap and it also has a a hole a larger hole that you can see 
it's easier to see where you're uh, where you're starting your lag bowl, um, where you pre-drilled your um, hole into the roof. And this is, you know, fully waterproof um, and certified for use on on a roof. And also, we have an, the nice the nice thing about this is that if you have an uneven roof, say you have sagging rafters. We have an additional optional item called the Grip Cap Plus, which gives you an extra inch of height. Um, so this only works with the flat. You can order optional Grip Cap Plus for those situations where you need that extra height. And then our lowest cost um, item is what we call the L mount. And uh, it's just a basic L foot on a flashing with a raised um, section here where the lag bolt goes through and the L foot just fits over that. Um, and all of these products are, you know, fully tested, listed and water, you know, water sealing. So it gives you options for different um, situations. And then we also have the Q mate Q mount quick mount, Q-base comp mount. And this allows you to have different standoff heights. So you, we have different post heights available. Um, and this can be used with the standard flashing for uh, comp shingle roofs. And then there's also options for other types of roofs that I'll talk about in another slide, but you would use our L foot on top of this for attaching the rail. And it just gives you another option for different post heights. So if you're doing tile roofs, um, we have two products, the all tile hook, uh, which is the Iron Ridge product, and then the quick mount, uh, quick hook. And there's just some subtle differences here. They both use the same optional deck flashing. Um, they have different lag positions to attach, um, to locate your rafter. The all tile hook is going to be a lower cost option, and that just gives you three placement locations on the uh, base for the hook. Whereas the quick hook slides on that base, and it's a little bit heavier materials, so it just gives you another option uh, depending on what you are looking for. And then uh, the other option that we have is a, what we call a knockout tile replacement, and this is an Iron Ridge product and allows you to replace the tile with this flashing. So if you get a tile and when you're walking on it, and this allows you to remove the tile and replace it with the flashing. And we have flashings for flat tile, for S tile and W tile. And these are standard con for standard concrete or cement tiles. Um, so if you have clay tile or an unusual tile, you wanna make sure that the flashing size that we offer uh, matches the tile that you have. And we also have the quick mount tile replacement mount. And it's the same thing where we have an S tile flashing, a flat tile and a W tile. And these use a, a post that is adjustable on here. And it goes, it has to go in that preformed hole on the flashing. Whereas the advantage of the, um, let me back up, the knockout pile is that you would poke this hole through anywhere in on the flashing. And you're actually putting the flashing over the base and then using this, um, L foot as your uh, form, and then you pound that with a rubber mallet, and it just punctures a hole right through, and that forms over this rubber gasket and it gives you a waterproof seal and allows more flexibility of where you locate that um, penetration for the L foot. So, and then the other option we have, so if you have a cedar shake roof, we have the plastic shake mount, and we also have the base metal shake and slate mount. So if you have a slate roof, metal shingles with shakes, this, these are your options for that. And, um, you know, metal shingles, I'm seeing more and more of that. I actually have uh, 
this type of shingle on my roof. So these standoff posts work well with that situation. So a new product that we have now for standing seam metal roofs is called a Lynx. This is a quick mount product and it can be used with any, well, majority of standing seam roofs on the market. Uh, the main thing is it has to have a minimum of one inch tall seam and a maximum of a half inch wide seam, whether it's a folding profile or a snapping profile. Whoops, I messed up. Um, so we have this uh, text sheet that shows the compatible profiles um, on our website. And then if we have a metal roof that we, we don't have an attachment for, we work with a third party supplier, S5, and they make uh, metal roof brackets for ribbed roofs, um, corrugated roofs, and other types of standing seam profiles that we don't support. So um, our system will work with that as well. We also make a conduit mount. Um, and so if you need to mount conduit across the roof, um, this can be attached anywhere. The lag is a standard flashing, so you can attach directly to the deck. And we have a cap, and uh, this can handle three-quarter, one-inch conduit. And then we also have a quick mount version um, that will take up to an inch and a half conduit as well. So all of these products are UL 2703 listed as a uh, system and bonding and grounding is provided so that you only need to have one ground lug uh, per row of modules because the module clamps give you bonding and grounding. Um, and you only really need that one ground lug per row of modules, not on every rail. So now I want to get into some of the advanced uh, design topics here. Um, this has to do with the building code. And building code is what drives our design requirements on uh, for all of our mounting systems. And you need to know what version of the code your location is on. So Inter most places are either using the 2015 International Building Code or the 2018. A reference ASCE 710 for 2015 and ASCE 716 for 2018. And that is the American Society of Civil Engineers developed these codes um, for guidance on, on structures. And so it's important to understand what your jurisdiction which version they're using. So these are the list of states that I have that I've adopted 2018 IBC. Um, but you can see here that there's still one state that's using 2003, I think that's Texas. Um, and then we have you know three states that are still on 2012. The majority are either 2015 or 2018. And some will start shifting to 2021 but that will still um, reference ASC 716. And there are a few states um, that vary by local jurisdiction. So from county to county, it may vary. And that makes it maddening for installers who work in a broader area. So you have to understand what, what the requirements are. So I want to do a little uh, sh comparison of what changed from 710 to 716. And um, basically the, the ground snow load, the exposure categories and the risk category, nothing changed there. Um, but the wind speed uh, charts, um, 710 went from 110 to 180 miles an hour. In the new wind tables, uh, they've gone down to 90 miles an hour in some areas. Um, in 716. And then by roof type, uh, it used to be that they just considered gable and hip the same in, in the code in 710. Now those are rated. Um, and then the roof zones, there were three roof zones, and now those are separated and enlarged so that you have more roof zones to consider. And then also the roof slope categories um, have increased 
Um, I mean, they're still the, within the same slope from zero to 45, but they've just uh, parsed those out a little differently. Uh, the other thing is the module size. And in new code, they've actually, it's not specified in 710, but in new code, they were going by module sizes that were common in 2016. And we've seen it, module sizes that increased. You can find modules now that are, you know, 500 watts and almost the size of a sheet of plywood. So we have updated our in, uh, certification letters to take this into consideration. Um, and we still comply with the code, even though we have larger modules available to work with. And then also the, uh, the other consideration of they've added um, sections for ex what they call exposed modules and edge modules. And I'll explain that in another slide here. So these are the wind maps, um, 710 left kind of the middle of the country as one big uh, area there. And now that's separated out a little. And um, they also have special wind zones. If so you, if you live in a mountain range area, um, those are what we call uh, case study areas. And you need to check with the local authority to verify, you know, because it's gonna be different if you're on a, on a ridge versus in the valley uh, in a mountain region. So this is how the roof zones have changed. So for gable roofs, um, it used to just be the three zones with zone one being the main section of the roof, zone two being the edge, and zone three being the corners. And now they parse that out as to, you know, whether it's um, the eave or the ridge um, and added these extra zones in there. And the same with the hip roofs. They've just added uh, different qualifiers or letters to whether it's an eave or a ridge. So edge modules um, are defined by the height of the, the module from the roof and then the distance from um, the edge of the roof. So the, the uplift increases on modules that are closer to the edge of the roof. And that's why they're defining that as, um, so anything. So in this case, let's say that the, the module is five inches from the roof surface to the top of the module um, height there. So that means that two times the distance from the, the array to the edge of the roof anything within 10 inches in this case would be uh, considered uh, an edge module. And if it's further away than 10 inches, then it's not considered an edge module. And what that means is it's just gonna have stricter or higher wind speed uh, considerations on these areas. And that means we may need to have more attachments to the roof on that bottom rail. So exposed modules, so if you have a gap and in your array and it's more than one module width or more than four feet, then that would be considered an exposed module. So that is where um, you have increased wind uplift. But it also has to do with the modules out on the end. So if building height is 25 feet, Anything more than half the building height from the roof edge is considered exposed. And that would include these modules in, in the area here where there's more than a four foot gap. So those would may be subject to having more attachments in the uh, design. And okay, so then we also have, I wanted to point out for those of you in Florida, or that would do any work in Florida, we have Florida product approval for the pitch roof um, products. And um, there are specific qualifications um, that you have to go through or make sure that to have the standard design for that. Um, you can check on our website or through our design tool. So rail orientation. So I wanna point out there's some quirks about our design tool. So you know, portrait is where the long side of the module is vertical and landscape is where is it's horizontal. But 
in our design tool, we also consider how it is in respect to the rail. So in this case, the rails are running east-west. And so portrait and landscape make sense. But if you are running the rails north-south, say you have a metal building and the, it, it has structural members that are running east-west and you wanna be perpendicular with your rails, you'd wanna run your rails north-south, but portrait then would be, it, would be in relation to um, the uh, the module to the uh, actually appears as it's in landscape from the ground, and that's just something to be aware of when you're using our design tool. So spans and cantilevers. So our design tool is all about determining what is the span between your roof attachments and. The cantilever is the amount of distance the rail can expand past the last roof attachment. So you can, we allow up to 40% of the max span or 36 inches max, depending on which version of the code, um, the lesser of that. Um, so if you have a span of four feet, then you, know, you could have a rated span, then your cantilever can be 40% of that and you optimize your spans. So in this here, you can see that there are four attachments on this rail, it's not optimized. So if you move those attachments and allow for a cantilever, you can reduce the number of attachments. So the other thing to consider is, you know, the tributary area or the modules and the, the, the weight or the loads on the roof and bands affected. So in this example, we have um, two rafters are spanned here using four foot attachments. And then if you use six foot spans, you're spanning three rafters. So you're putting more of a load on these rafters by spanning longer distances here. But if you wanted to reduce that load, you can stagger your attachments so that it, in this example, you still have six foot spans, but you've staggered the, um, the other rail attachments. Um, so now you only are spanning one and a half rafters per span because of how the roof is seeing the load. So the, uh, we'll go through a little bit of installation tips and tricks here. And um, I always, uh, you know, emphasize that installers uh, should be thinking about safety, have a tailgate meeting to cover, you know, rooftop safety, have a plan for getting installers and materials safely on and off the roof, and, you know, and wear ear protection, eye protection, sunscreen, you should have fall protection, um, follow the OSHA regulations for all, uh, for a safe installation. So locating rafters is always a, a challenge. And there are, there are many types of stud finders, but you know, I have not found one that works reliably on a roof. They're great for drywall where you have a thinner, but you know, on a roof, you have a lot more material to go through and a lot more nails um, that could throw it off. So we like to use the tap meth method with a hammer. So you're just listening for that uh, thud when you hit a rafter, it sounds more hollow when you're in between the rafters. And then once you've located that, you can pre-drill your hole. And um, if you hit the rafter, then that's where you're gonna be lagging into. If you miss the hole, don't keep drilling, just stick a piece of uh, bent wire in there and locate the rafter and measure where it is and then reposition your hole and then make sure to properly seal that hole. It would be underneath the flashing, but you still should put a roof sealant in it or you can even take a, a you know, piece of step flashing to stick underneath there to seal that. So it's also important that when you're uh, doing the flashings that you're following the, you know, you want to be up under the third course of shingles up above. So 
it's okay. I mean, this is the ideal where the edge of the module, or I mean, the edge, excuse me, the edge of the flashing is flush with the this row of shingles here. And you've got coverage up under that third course there. In this example, you're hanging over here, correct, and you're not getting coverage. It's okay to cut out pieces of that uh, shingle to get it up further. And also, if you're hitting nails, you can either pull those nails um, and make sure that you seal everything down, or you can trim um, the uh, flashing. I like to use just to cut a V-notch in it. So if you're hitting a nail, you push that up there, you find out where that nail is by denting the flashing, pull it back out, just cut a little V-notch with tin snips so that the flashing can push up past the nail. And um, I find that that's a good way to do it. So you don't need to put a lot of uh, adhesive on the flashing. Um, we just recommend to put backfill the pilot hole with some roof sealant and um, then put your lag bolt in and that will uh, give you proper coverage and uh, give you a good roof seal. Always use a torque wrench when, and follow our torque specs. Uh, you know, the, the UFO or module clamps are only 80 inch pounds, you know, not the pound, that's inch pounds. So you want a torque wrench that can read inch pounds. You can use a drill with a clutch um, to uh, install the hardware. Uh, just don't overdo it. Um, if you're using an impact driver, those are fine for the lags in the rafter, but don't use that on the hardware. Um, and always check the torque after you've uh, assembled the hardware. So this is just some pictures of what it looks like uh, for if you were doing a tile roof, you're you know, removing the tile. Um, in the case of the tile hook, you're going to reinstall the tile after you put it in the tile hook. And uh, or replacement, actually replacing the tile with these flashings. And this kind of gives uh, the simple steps of doing that knockout uh, tile. So you're removing the tile, you're placing the base, and then you, you fit the flashing in, and then you actually um, are punching a hole um, with a hammer so that you're actually using the L foot as the guide there. And you'll see a little dimple on the flashing. These are soft aluminum, so it's easy to punch through. And then you, you punch that in and it actually forms to that gasket seal and gives you a good seal. So also the conduit mounts can be used to mount uh, boxes, junction boxes on there. There are uh, quarter inch threaded nuts on the cap. So you can attach them, um, like Unistrut or a, a, a junction box to that. And um, that gives you more options than just running conduit as well. So I want to go through, um, let's see, I got to figure out how to, I'm going to stop share a minute and then go back to share and choose the different screen. Let's see which one it is. Okay. Uh, I got to close that out. That I have to get this screen pulled up here. Okay, here we go. All right, so I hope that, Sean, can I, you see that screen there? When I change yep. to my Yeah, projects. we look good. Okay, so if you're using our design tool, um, you would go to the website here and where it says design tools. Uh, in the menu, you're going to select the type of roof that you want. 
or in this case, pitch roof, and then click on that, and it's going to take you um, to a site where you have a window showing the um, this look, and you were going to type in your location here, and then you would go um, from there into the design tool. So we recommend to start an account if you don't already have one. That way you can save the project in there and you can um, call us with questions about the project and um, you would have project IDs assigned to that. So if I go to my projects here, you can see that I have a list of projects and an ID number next to it. This ID number is what, if you're calling us with a question, ask us, you know, give us that number and we can look it up. So I've got a project started here. And so you would go into, after you put in your address, it's gonna take you to this page um, and you're, you can name the project, whatever you want here. And then you're gonna choose your building code. So as we talked to, you know, need to know what your code is. And, um, and in this drop down, it's going to be 710 or 716. The snow load and wind speed will automatically be um, loaded based on your location. If you know that you need to, your local jurisdiction has a different snow load or wind speed, you can adjust that. You would need to determine your wind exposure here. So, and if you have a question about what these things mean, click on that little eye there. And it gives you a little pop-up window that explains you know, the exposure B is your, you know, an urban or suburban wooded area with a lot of terrain that's closely spaced to uh, blocks the wind. Exposure C is more open with scattered obstructions. And then exposure D would be if you're on a lake or on the coast. Um, and then risk category, most residential are gonna be category two. Uh, category three gets into more public buildings like schools and uh, things. <clears throat> and then you're going to select the module. So in this window, you're going to have uh, the selection window and you select the manufacturer. I've pre-selected here and then you're going to drop down and pick um, the module that you're using and make sure that you have the specific panel. And if you if we don't have it in the list, you can contact tech support with a spec sheet and we can add it. And then if you have an older panel that um, is not supported anymore, you can also do custom panels in here where you put your own dimensions in. And um, so, and then here you have the panel finish. So if you have black frames, you could click black and it's gonna give you black hardware. And this is where you would select the end clamp, um, whether it's a UFO, a stopper sleeve, or a camo. And then this is the design mode. So this is a new feature here. And we're going to go through quick mode first. But there's also a new uh, image-based version, which I'm going to help go through as well. So I'm going to save that. So always click Save, and whenever you make a change, so then down here is where you select your roof type. And then based on what the selection is there, you're going to have options here for which roof attachment. And then the attachment hardware. So that the attachment hardware can be either one. Um, it's just installer's preference. A square bolt has to slide in the end of the rail. Um, and it won't fall out as easily. Um, the T-bolt can be installed anywhere along the rail. Just a installer's preference there. If you want to add conduit mounts, that's where you can do that here. Conduit penetration flashing as well. And then you would state the building height, your roof slope, your rafter spacing. And spectral acceleration is not really, it's pre, this, this, this has to do with if you live in an earthquake area, what the, uh, how much the ground moves. And so you don't need to generally worry about that, but it is automatically um, spec based on your location. So then you're gonna come down here and you click add roof sections and we like graphical. So it, here it, we have an option for roof section one here. 
So you would choose if you want your rails running east, west, or north, south, and whether you want the modules in portrait or landscape. So this is in portrait for east, west road um, situation. So you can click and drag to create your array here. And then if you need to remove modules, you can remove back and you can remove modules. And then say if you wanted to do um, some modules in quick mode in landscape as well, you need to add another roof section here um, to do that. So then we can go in landscape, click save, and now the modules are in landscape and say you wanted to have one row of, of modules in landscape. Now in the image base, based version, you can do this all in one roof surface, um, but in the quick mode, it's you have to have it in separate. So then you would go down here to where it says rail span and force. So it automatically, this defaults to four feet no matter what. And it's XR100 rail. You can change this. So down here, you'll notice that the, the max span for the given load conditions in this situation, XR10 is four foot five in all three roof zones, and XR100 is six foot two, and XR1000 is eight foot. So we could do, we could change this um, to. Um, keyboard here out of my place here. Um, so we could change that um, to six there in the same with the landscape. If we're using XR100, and now you'll see that the XR10 are in red because that span exceeds the rating for that rail, but we're using XR100, so you're fine. Um, also, if you're using, you know, our standard rail lengths are 14 and 7 feet, or 14 and 17 feet. If you need, if you know that, say you have short sections, um, you can tell the design tool to cut any short sections so that you're not you're getting excess rail. And click save, and that'll just change the bill of materials um, to allow you to um, do that. And then the bill, so, and as we're making changes, you can see up here, it summarizes how many modules, how many attachments, and our uh, manufacturer's suggested list price. And then you would go to bill of materials page, um, and you will get a list of materials, and this is what you would submit to Alti, and they can uh, order your components based on that. So. If you're buying accessories, if you want wire clips and end caps, microinverter hardware or junction box, you know, you can save here and that gets added down here to your bill of materials. And if you need to edit, you can add spares of anything. And most important is this green button up here is where your project report is. You can print a PDF of that. And you also have, if you have a, a CAD viewer on your um, computer, you can uh, download a CAD file of your array. And then also there's a bill of materials as a PDF and as a spreadsheet. And then you can also email these um, to people as well. So, and then you, over here is your certification letter. And uh, this is the stamp, engineer stamp certification letter. Um, for the design. And if you want to get a full permit pack that includes electrical and stuff, um, this will take you to a website by a, or uh, a third party uh, provider called Green Lancer. And they have a discount um, for Iron Ridge users to uh, give you a full permit pack as well. So now I'm going to run back um, and go through the image base version and see if we can, because that is a little more complicated. 
All right, let me go back. Where is all this? Okay. Um, yeah, there we go. So I started one here for the image based, based version, and this is where you select it in this design style um, section over here. And, um, you know, this allows you to and through and see a vision of this on, on, the, on a map actually. So in the layout editor, um, you know, this is a flat roof. This is the warehouse of, of Alti, but I did an actual house nearby in here where you can see that we've drawn an actual project on there. So let's see if I can go back and, and edit that. So you select um, roof planes. And then this is where you come in and you click the corners of the roof and you're um, creating the roof plane. So in this case, if we go back, it would be like that. And you're just clicking the corners. And then that would be your roof section B there. So, and then you would go to next. And this is where, so I didn't save that one. So um, you always have to click the, the save button whenever you make changes, but I just wanted to show you how to draw that section. Then you have to define where the eave is, where the bottom of it is. So in this case, uh, we've done that. And then you go to the verify properties. Oh, here we go. Here's roof section B, excuse me. My computer is slow. All right, so in this case, you would select that as the Eve and then click save. And then you're gonna to go to verify roof properties. And if you already put that information in there, you can say to import from the defaults of your project or you can edit it here and then click save. And then once you've done that, then you're gonna click next. And then now you have the setbacks. So the purple lines are the setbacks and then the yellow area is um, where you don't wanna put modules. So you can adjust that so that it lines up with your setbacks and you can change these setbacks here as well. Um, And you can make that whatever you want based on the codes in your location because there are different fire setbacks required in different areas. So again, click save. And then we'll go to next. And now you have the roof layout here. So the rafter offset. So the rafters start automatically um, at the edge there, but if you know the actual placement of the rafters is different, you can um, click this by however many inches and it actually moves the uh, rafter positions over. So we'll leave that at zero and we'll click save. Now you can, um, We can add the array here. Let's see, click save. So now, let's see, we're gonna click select. All right, what did I do wrong here? You have to save B. Yeah, I already saved B. I'm gonna go back to A. So in this case, oh yeah, okay. So let me go back. I thought I saved B. But you can see in A here that we've selected. I mean, I, I, I can mix orientations here. So I just want to point that out. So we've saved B. You got to click C on top to save it. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's what I've got. All right. So we have click save. So I'm having, well, I'm going to go back to A because I want to show you, or wait a minute, let me see if that allows me. So yeah, oh, okay, that's what I did wrong. All right, I'm, uh, this is new, a new thing for us, so I'm even still learning. So now you, once you've clicked draw, that's where I was messing up, AJ. So now you select portrait or landscape, and then now you can come in and see how many modules you can fit in that area. Um, and then once you have that, you click save. And then you can select that. Um, or you can select either individual modules or you can select and nudge that here, left, right, up or down, however you want. And then let's say we wanna go back and add some modules in landscape on here. So we can add modules in landscape, we click select, and then we can nudge that down. So now we've created um, our project with modules in landscape and modules in portrait. So now we can go to next. I click save already. So this image-based version gives you a lot more uh, detailed tools to work with. So it's a great um, tool, um, but the quick mode is, is easy, easy to use if you already know your layout and you just wanna get a quick build of materials. So the difference in this quick mode is it's gonna suggest the rail and the span already here. You can select a different, span, a different one if you want. Um, but it's going to give you the, what's, um, what it thinks is the most efficient use. And then you can also do your reaction forces here. That's the amount of force per attachment. So it just has a little bit different view, but, and then also the actual placement of the attachments based on this layout. And I have staggering. Um, selected here. If you do no um, and you click save, then it's going to put the, uh, it will not consider staggering in the layout. So it gives you a lot of options. Um, and also you can, you know, if this is where it's important to understand where the rafter locations are and uh, how you want to spend that on the roof. So whether you're you know, it'll make a difference in here. The other thing that I didn't, that I missed here, you'll notice that everything here is in yellow or red because I selected those as zone two. And um, so it gives me um, calculations for zone two here. And then um, in this case, I didn't select for the roof zones. So I think we're running out of time. So. Um, if you have questions, um, you can try now or we can or please come to our uh, networking session later and we can sit down and talk with you at that point and go over um, all the details of this. You have anything to add, AJ? Oh, I think you did a great job. That's uh, that was fantastic. That the A tool really is something special, guys. So if you've never used it, Please get on and start playing around with it. I put it in there. It's as simple as going to ironridge.com, uh, clicking on the D8 tool. All you have to do is put in a, uh, your email, create your own password, and, and st start designing. And again, it creates bombs for you very, very quickly. You can share them with, uh, with Alt D. They can put the, uh, fill the materials together for you. So uh, just please sign up and, 
and uh, and start designing.